Introducing today's speaker and moderating today's event is going to be David Driscoll. This is an opportunity for uh, Rotarians and guests to meet the candidates for Boulder County Sheriff, David Hayes and Curtis Johnson. This is not a debate, it's more of a discussion um, or informal candidate forum. These gentlemen are both Democrats. There is no Republican candidate in this race. A winner of the Democratic nomination will be determined on, in our June 28, that's later this month, June 28 primary. Ballots will be mailed to all of us this coming Monday. These two candidates are vying to succeed Joe Pelly, who has served as Boulder County Sheriff since 2003. The Boulder County Sheriff's Office provides public safety services to residents and visitors of Boulder County. Among other things, the Sheriff is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the Boulder County Jail and the Office of Emergency Management. I will now introduce the candidates. To my right is David Hayes. He is the Chief of Police in Louisville and has been for the last eight years. He was born and raised in Denver. He has two adult daughters. David served at the Boulder County Police Department from 1978 until 2014. On my left is Curtis Johnson. Um, he currently serves as a division chief in the Boulder County Sheriff's Office. He was born and raised in Boulder County. He has been married for 28 years and has two adult children. He served in the Boulder County Police, I'm sorry, in the Boulder Police Department for 27 years. So the format um, that we're going to follow today is that uh, each of the candidates will have uh, six minutes to make opening remarks, followed by uh, a three minute response from each. We uh, tossed a coin uh, just, just before lunch started to determine who would go first, and David Hayes will go first. <laughs> so six minutes for opening statements followed by three minutes for responses. After that, we hope to have a question and answer uh, session uh, that will last about 10 minutes. Um, so with no further ado, David Hayes. I'm happy to go. Yeah, thank you. I can go first. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm Dave Hayes, um, as introduced. I'm the current police, chief of police in Louisville. Uh, previous to that, I spent a number of years in the Boulder Police Department. And I want to tell you a little bit more about me. Uh, born, as mentioned, born and raised in Denver, Colorado. I raised my two daughters in uh, Louisville. Uh, they're both now young adults. And I'm going to talk, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the men and women of the Louisville Police Department, the agency that I currently am responsible for and provide leadership to. We have a great organization. We have a great relationship with our schools, with our hospitals, with our places of worship. Um, and as you also know, that we're one of a couple of communities that was hit pretty hard by the Marshall Fire. Um, and given the number of people here, I know that there's some of you folks that were probably affected and certainly know somebody uh, involved in the fire. Uh, both my opponent and I both lost our homes, so we're two of the 1,087 people that you keep hearing about. Uh, if that's taught me anything, it's taught me uh, how to be resilient and has also given me some experience at, at, at being a, a victim. 
But with that said, we still have work to do uh, in our community. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a long, long process. Um, you know, in, in terms of work in the community and work in the department, we've done a lot in the last eight years under my direction. We brought on body cams uh, long before the state mandate. We uh, brought on a new system called Taser. Uh, over the last couple of years, the, uh, um, the, the Taser system has gotten a lot of uh, bad publicity, sometimes misused by police. We went to a new system called BOLA Wrap, B-O-L-A. It's a much safer way to take somebody in custody, especially for somebody that's had some mental health issues. Uh, we became accredited in the last eight years, the first ever in the history of our department. We're now accredited by the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police and the County Sheriffs of Colorado. Speaking, the, speaking of the Colorado Chiefs Association, I'm currently the Vice President of the Colorado Chiefs Association, and in July, um, I'll be the, the President of the Colorado Chiefs Association uh, going forward. Um, assuming that I don't get elected, that would be my position, but it is my plan to get elected at the end of this month. Um, so getting back to the fire, one of the things that we learned, um, it, it, fortunately we had COVID to help us become more resilient in things. We learned that our cist, uh, citizen notification system needs some work. We're continuing to work on that. The city of Louisville police and fire department are, are moving forward with that. We're uh, at the table and leading that uh, forward. We also learned that we did not have a, um, a, a great polygon system or any polygon system for that matter. And what that means is, is that when there is an emergency and we're trying to evacuate this neighborhood or that neighborhood, how do we do that? And you can actually draw some, uh, some lines on a map and try to outguess what, whatever the event might be, whether it be a flood or a fire or a storm. We discovered that uh, in, in the eastern part of Boulder County, there are none. So we're also working on that in, in earnest to get that done. The other thing that we discovered, and it's, it's, it's important, I, I'm not, certainly not suggesting that this would have changed anything, but we know in terms of our fire department response, they've been asking for a couple of years for a differential response, much like if we sent an officer to a theft call, we would probably send one officer. If it was a robbery call or a burglary in progress, we would probably we would send more officers and, and perhaps even more officers than that. But what's been going on in Boulder County is it's kind of the kind of Groundhog Day over and over again. So in this particular case, on the day of the Marshall Fire, we uh, dispatched what we normally do, even though we had up to 110 mile an hour wind and as much as 120 mile an hour wind, cold, a dry day, as, we, as you know, we had a very dry December. The equipment that we sent on that day is the same equipment that we would send on a wintry day with snow on the ground. Uh, that needs to change. That's one of the things that's going to change when I become sheriff. The people that should be telling us um, how, to, how they want to be dispatched, in this particular case, it's our fire chiefs and fire officials. That's who we need to listen to, and we need to, uh, to dispatch accordingly. Um, the other issue that we're dealing with in law enforcement, and it's going to be the sheriff's responsibility as well, is uh, the fentanyl crisis. The last couple of days, I've been at the Colorado Fentanyl uh, Summit in Denver. Fentanyl is killing our men, women, and children. It is highly addictive. Uh, most people are not taking fentanyl, perhaps for an additional high, but they're certainly not taking it uh, knowing that they're going to end up dying. One minute left. Yeah, thank you. So fentanyl is another issue we talked about. Uh, oh, in, in terms of floods, in, ter in terms of fires as well, where the Lewis, city of Louisville Police and Fire Department are holding a, a tabletop exercise next week to continue our fire planning. And I'll stop there. Thank you. And now, Curtis Johnson. Do you mind if I stand? I'm better. Which one do you want me to use? Good to go? All right. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Thank you. I first appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm glad you're having us. Um, I think my opponent is getting tired of hearing we're getting tired of hearing each other say the exact same things at all the forums, um, but it's good conversation and we appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you. My name's Curtis Johnson. As Mr. Driscoll mentioned, I'm born and raised here in Boulder, grew up just about a mile west of here. I'm a product of the Boulder Valley School District and uh, currently married. In two weeks, it'll be 29 years. Uh, my wife and I are currently living in Lafayette. We were displaced by the fire, as was mentioned. 
but we had a great meeting this morning with our builder and we're really excited to get back to our community where we were and rebuild our home and get back to uh, feeling like we beat the fire. And to do that, we need to rebuild and get back to our neighborhood. Um, I have two adult children, both of them work in education. They're both up in Longmont, so they're close by. But with everything that's happened in schools lately, uh, certainly common sense approaches to gun control are important to me and looking at ways to prevent gun violence are important to me. Um, when I was a senior or junior in high school at Fairview, I became involved in the cadet program at the Boulder County Sheriff's Office. And that opened my eyes to a career in policing. It got me excited about a career path that I thought I'd wanna follow. And uh, I fell in love with the fact that you could actually go out and work with the community, make meaningful impact, solve problems, not be tied to a desk, and every day would be different. And so I went away to the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington and got a bachelor's degree, then jumped across the country to Washington, D.C. and got a master's in public administration at the American University, and came back to Boulder in 1993 and started my career with the Boulder Police Department. At the police department, I started where we all do as a patrol officer, uh, low seniority, working nights and weekends on University Hill, meeting college kids at their finest. And uh, I advanced my career through detectives into professional standards where I got to work internal affairs investigations. One of the most meaningful jobs I had because in that position you get direct community feedback about how your organization is performing and what people are unhappy with and you have to try to resolve that and address it and also hold employees accountable which is important to me. Um, in 2014 I was elevated to the rank of Deputy Chief of Police. I spent about four years running the operations side of the police department, which is about 75% of the organization. All of the men and women who are out actually addressing the community on the front line were under my command. After four years of that, I switched over to the support services side of the organization where I was responsible for budget, over $30 million budget for the Boulder Police Department, personnel, hiring, training, dispatch, records, all of those other functions. So well-rounded opportunities. In, uh, Mid-2020, our sheriff, Joe Pelly, reached out to me because he was looking at who might replace him someday. And in Boulder County, to run for sheriff, you have to live in the county and you have to be a Democrat. And I checked those two boxes and we had a long conversation together about what it would mean to run the sheriff's office. And he's invested 20 years of his life in building a great organization and he wanted to make sure that whoever was running for office would be capable of taking it over and succeed him successfully. Um, in early 2021, there was a retirement at the sheriff's office, which provided an opportunity for me to leave the Boulder Police Department and go to work at the sheriff's office. So for the past 15 months, I've been working at the sheriff's office with Sheriff Pelly and learning about the organization and the complex nature of the work at the county level. It's very different than a municipal police department because you're responsible for the jail setting, where we're responsible for the health and safety of about 415 inmates as of this morning. Um, we're also responsible for wildfire response in the county, something that unfortunately Dave and I both know very much about. Um, we also handle emergency services and rescues throughout the mountains. And we have a very diverse demography in Boulder County. We're the police department for Lyons. We're also the police department for Superior, two very different communities. We are the police department for unincorporated Boulder County, and we have to work well with everyone and have an employee base that can work in that diverse environment, manage the mountains and the flats. I'm down to about a minute. Uh, I know I have three more minutes coming, and during that three minutes, I'll share with you what's really important to me moving forward, what I want to address as sheriff. Thanks. Thank you. David Hayes, three minutes. Thank you, it's, uh, just to continue on a little bit, so what am I gonna do as your next sheriff? One of the things that we've done in Louisville is we've created a value-based management system, making sure that we're doing the right thing, making sure that we have a diverse work group, making sure that we're treating our community members well. In Louisville, we do a couple things really well, and on top of everything else is, we of course practice constitutional policing, which means we have to look out for the uh, constitutional rights for everybody. We investigate beyond the obvious, we also leave things better than we found them. And uh, finally, what we do uh, in Louisville is that we uh, 
certainly we're not concerned whatsoever about somebody's race, ethnicity, sex, sexual preference, those kind of things, um, and certainly don't pay no attention to somebody's immigration status. Our job is to provide police services to everyone and protect everyone's constitutional rights. One of the things that I think we need to work on in the sheriff's office, Joe has done a good job, but I think there is a need for a culture change, and as an outside person, I can do that. As we know, in the last couple of years, we now have two deputies in the Department of Corrections because they were uh, indicted and then arrested and convicted for manslaughter for the treatment of a young man that was a CU student and their care of him or lack of care of him, and they're now serving time in the Department of Corrections. Most recently in the jail, we had an on-duty jail sergeant, a young, man, a young man of color came into the jail after being arrested in Longmont. Uh, was secured in a chair, uh, in, confined in a chair in the jail, I think was a little obnoxious with the jail staff there, and in particular a sergeant, and that sergeant, uh, again, on-duty sergeant, uh, tasered him or tortured him with the taser. Uh, that's bad enough, those incidents are bad enough, but the day that that occurred in the jail, that was the same day that Boulder County Commissioners settled with another woman that had been tasered in the jail, and they settled with her for, I think, about $700,000. So make no mistake about it, I think the Sheriff's Office, for the most part, runs well, but it is also time for a look at our culture change and what I promise is a good, diverse work group. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis Johnson. Three minutes, please. Three minutes goes fast. Um, I don't disagree with my opponent about holding employees accountable, being transparent about how we do that and when appropriate, criminally charging employees who do wrong. Um, all those cases occurred before I joined the Sheriff's Office, but I know them well because I'm having to deal with them still today as a member of the Sheriff's Office. A couple of things that are really important to me and things that I want to work on as Sheriff. One, we have a mental health crisis in the criminal justice system. As of today, 60 to 70 percent of the people in the jail are diagnosed mentally ill. And jail is not always the right setting for those people to become stabilized and working with people like Judy Amabile, who's a state rep who's passionate about mental health. Her and I have talked at length. She supports my campaign because we know there are better solutions than just incarcerating people because of their mental illness. Wildfire preparedness and response. We learned a lot during the Marshall Fire. It's a game changer because a lot of our efforts have been focused on the western half of the county where wildfires traditionally occur. We now know that everyone in the county could be the victim of a disaster like a wildfire. And I happened to be in this room two weeks ago talking with people who want to start a program about wildfire preparedness and informing our community. I look forward to partnering with community groups to make sure that everyone in the county is aware of what systems are in place and how to be prepared for a disaster when it occurs, because it's going to happen again in our community. Um, finally, hiring and retaining a diverse workforce. Uh, I'm committed to that. I want a workforce that reflects the county that we serve. It's a challenge for us because most of our employees don't live in Boulder County. So how do we draw people to Boulder County that have to commute to work, or can we look at housing options for people to encourage them to live in the community where they serve? Um, we need to do better on making sure that we have a diverse workforce and one that represents the community that we serve every day. Thanks. Thank you both. We now have about 10 minutes for questions, and the way that we're gonna handle the questions is Vanessa will um, we'll pass the, the microphone uh, to you. I would simply ask that uh, for each question, uh, you pose the question uh, to both candidates, not to a single candidate, and uh, each candidate will have one minute to respond. Uh. Yes, uh, speaking of mental health, our, committee, our, our behavioral wellness committee met this morning and we were talking about the new 988, I believe it is, system that's supposed to go into effect, I think in about a month. And most of us have heard nothing about that. So I wonder if you could describe a little bit about what that's supposed to be and how you're gonna stand it up if you're at all responsible for that. Okay. So the 988 system is actually a three-digit number that replaces a currently in place 1-800 number for suicide prevention. Uh, it does not interface with the dispatch center. It goes directly 
to a suicide hotline or suicide prevention organization that already exists. So uh, I, last I knew, and we have not got very much information, the most information I've received is a text from my cell phone carrier saying this is coming. Um, but my understanding is it doesn't cross over into the services we provide. It runs to a separate suicide prevention center and should they need us, that center would contact us to respond. Thank you. Just adding a little bit to what Kurt said, uh, mental health is affecting men, women, and children in our community. There's not enough police officers. There's also not enough mental health clinicians even to refer people to. Sometimes people are waiting weeks for appointments. One of the things that the Chiefs Association is going to do in February, or I'm sorry, in July, when we meet with the Attorney General is maybe even look at a Peace Corps or a Job Corps program to get more people interested in the mental health profession as clinicians and at the same time uh, as police officers. On the board of the Association for Community Living, and we advocate for families with special needs children, grown and child. And one of the things we are facing is it, to have the police understand what people with severe disabilities are like. So if they're called to a home where there's a problem, they understand this isn't a usual case and they handle it in a sensitive, nuanced manner. So I wonder what your thoughts are about moving forward in that area. Yeah, absolutely. We do a lot of training in that area. We make sure that, again, we provide good police services to all. We will when I'm the sheriff. And that there are different dy family dynamics in all kinds of areas. But one of the areas that we need to learn more about that is, is that, because it, it's just a little bit different. The officers need to continue to be kind in, in their response. And, and also, while I'm at it, most of what we do in Boulder County, fortunately, is not a lot of direct police work. Most of what we do is community work, and that's what we want our officers to do and continue to do. I very much appreciate that question. My son is, uh, works in, with kids with special needs uh, as an educator in St. Vrain School District. And uh, one of the programs we had at the Boulder Police Department really created an interface for kids with special needs. It's called Safety First, and it allowed law enforcement to interact with people with special needs and provide training to our community with special needs and vice versa, allow us to be trained by them. And that's a program that started at the police department that I was involved in. And it's something I would absolutely look at bringing to the sheriff's office to widen our exposure to your community and also help us understand the challenges we may have interacting with people with special needs. Uh, being a resident of Superior, I would like to compliment you and your force on how you responded during the fire. The officers acted as heroes during a horrendous firestorm. And I've been making a point when I see officers cruising the neighborhoods of stopping them and thanking them for their heroic service during that tremendous fire. I think without their efforts, there would have been hundreds of people killed. So thank you. Question on uh, concealed carry comments? Thank you. So is there a question about concealed carry? Yeah, what are your thoughts? Well, so right now, we're statutorily bound by what the state legislature says. Um, the sheriff shall issue concealed weapons permits to those who meet the criteria. One of the challenges with that though, I think the bar, the criteria is too low. It is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to determine whether somebody has received mental health treatment or care or has a mental illness before they get issued a concealed carry permit. The background check part of it, the criminal side, is easy but all of the other factors that go into why someone may want a gun or how they will use it is challenging for us when issuing concealed weapons permits. Uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to concealed carry when those guns are in the right hands, but I wanna make sure we're doing everything we can to keep them out of the wrong hands. Thanks. Thank you, just adding a little bit to what Kurt said, I appreciate your thank you, because that was both uh, on the Superior side and on Louisville side. We're all thankful, both the Sheriff's Office and the Police Department in Louisville for the help that we got, which was literally hundreds of officers from throughout the state coming over to help us to keep our neighborhood safe. 
um, as, to, as to the firearm question or concealed weapon question. I'm also not opposed to that, but I think there are some tightening things we can do to tighten down. For instance, some, maybe some additional training and some additional qualifications. Um, it, it's, uh, it's important that, that we have that. I'm, I support that, but I think there's some additional work we can do without stopping what we're doing, but just to, uh, to narrow it down a little bit more. We've witnessed some horrific shootings recently, and I'd like to ask you if you think that our public schools are safe. And secondly, in Uvalde, it's appearing to look like officers cowered in the hallway while children were being murdered in the classroom. How are officers trained to stand up in situations like that? So I'll go first. First, I can speak to Boulder Valley Schools, which is the ones we have in, in Louisville. I think there's always more work to be done. Um, I think at some point we're going to get to the point, maybe like we've got out at Denver International Airport, where you actually have one way in and one way out. Unfortunately, I, I think that we're there. So yes, I think we could make the schools more safe and probably even some electronic monitoring. There's some, some information or devices out there that will, will even alert us as to whether or not somebody's got a gun in the school and help trace that person through the school. In terms of that response uh, down in, in the great state of Texas, um, I agree from what I've heard anyway. In Boulder County, we trained after Columbine something called rapid emergency deployment. Whether you're one officer or five officers, depending on how far your cover units are away, um, I would be committed, uh, Sheriff's Office would be committed, that if you're the first one there and there's an active shooter, you may go in the school by yourself. That's what you signed up to do and that's what you took an oath to do. So I very much appreciate the question about school safety. Um, as a parent of two teachers, I shouldn't have to worry about them going to work every day, but I do. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done on school safety. I, I think we have challenges in our community with whether school resource officers are the right option or not. Um, I think there are some decisions that need to be made by the communities involved about whether that's appropriate for those school settings. But I do think we need to look very closely at school security and can continue to, and we need to partner with the school districts to make sure we're doing everything we can to support those efforts. Uh, the second part of your question, uh, I think a prime example of how we do things in Boulder is what happened at King Supers um, about a year and a half ago. No fear on the part of the police officers and the sheriff's deputies that entered that store looking for someone who was actively killing people. That's what we train people to do. Unfortunately, one of our officers lost their life doing that, but as was mentioned, um, that goes with the job today. That is part of the expectation, and that is our joint commitment countywide. We all train together on these tactics so that we can all deploy the same way, and standing around and waiting is not an option for us. We have time for one more. Uh I was wondering, um, what are your thoughts on rehabilitation in the jail system and, and what would it look like? Because as much as we talk about mental health issues, we're talking about the community, we're not talking about the jail community. I very much appreciate that question too. Um, I, so right now, in the jail, there is a lot of work and effort put towards transitioning people out of custody and back into the community and helping them find stabilization outside the jail setting where they have meaningful employment, housing, and support. Um, in the next couple of months, we'll be breaking ground on a new facility by the jail. It's called the Alternative Sentencing Facility. It'll house 252 people who will be eligible for community correction sentences or work release sentences, and will allow us to let people keep community connection, which is very important after you've served your sentence to be connected to the community you came from as well as providing them services for behavioral health, whether it's mental illness, drug or alcohol issues, providing them support for that. In some cases, allowing them to continue to work in the community during the day and come back to that facility at night. It is a not built like a jail. It is built more like a transitional housing community where we can provide services and allow people to hopefully leave that after serving their sentence, leave our custody and not repeat offend and come back to our facility. Thanks. 
I certainly agree with uh, uh, what Kurt said. In addition to that, I just this morning, I talked to an executive from the Colorado Department of Corrections. They're at 15,000 inmates as of today, and the, the, uh, the inn is full. They have no more room without opening up another building, and they're also 1,000 people short in their staff. So um, I, I, at the county level or at the state level, as we've typically done, we'll have to handle this. For those that don't go to the Department of Corrections, we do need to get people what they need, medical, dental, mental health treatment. Uh, and by the way, the people that belong in jail are the people that create a risk for somebody else, a victim or the community, or they have a history of failure to appear. We have a responsibility to make sure that, that, we, that we, people make a court appearance. And, and by the way, if you don't have to go to jail and there's not an arrest warrant that's, that will be issued for you because the jail won't take you, then you, is, you can't be a victim. Because you can't, without, without a defendant, you can't be a victim, which means you're also not eligible for uh, restitution and to be able to make a statement to the court. So it's a balance. Not everybody belongs in jail, but we do need to make sure that people do make a court appearance. And of course, if there's a danger to the community, they have to remain. But I also agree with Kurt, we got to get people moving on in the system and, and hopefully make them productive members of society because we know at the state level um, they get a failing grade of about 50 percent, about 50 percent return to the Department of Corrections, I think within a year. David Hayes and Curtis Johnson, thank you very much. The, de the ballots are being mailed on Monday, this coming Monday, June 28 is the date of the primary. I now wanted to recognize um, Bobby Brown. Gentlemen, thank you very much. 35 years ago, Boulder, or rather Rotary International, began a program to eradicate polio. It seemed like a ridiculously ambitious idea, but actually we're very close. There are only a handful of cases reported last year in the entire world. In your names, Boulder Rotary will donate 100 doses of polio vaccine to try to help finish the job. As for the sheriff's office, you have enormous responsibility, as we have heard. You have to coordinate police agencies, 23 fire departments, a jail with all, uh, all kinds of problems. We really appreciate having you. And first and foremost, though, we know that we count on you to protect us in a very dangerous world. We thank you for your combined six decades of service to our community. Thank you very much. <laughs>